Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic and today's guest is Dr. John Leaf. He's a neuropsychiatrist with a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics from Yale University and a doctorate in medicine from Harvard Medical School. Known as an innovator in several medical fields, he pioneered the creation of integrated treatment units that focus on complex patients with combined medical, psychiatric and neurological problems. He built some of the first geriatric medical psychiatric hospital units and the largest geriatric treatment network in New England, which he directed for 25 years. Furthermore, he is an expert and innovator in developing specialised innovative treatment programs for brain injured patients. I can't say too much more about John other than the conversation we had in this episode was really refreshing with his approach towards evidence-based, scientific-based uh, observation and understanding of the world without having to then put a layer of a narrative or a story or, or putting connections together that we do so, so easily as human beings. So I think John has a refreshing view of uh, not only medicine but also how it integrates with uh, being a human being and, and understanding how our cells communicate with each other. Um, quite an inspiring conversation today for, for me uh, and, and, and humbling to recognise how little I know uh, in, in, in so many fields. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr John Leaf. A big thank you and a welcome to you, John, for coming on to the show to talk about your your book, The Secret Language of Cells. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Now, John, you've got to uh, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself before we get stuck into your book, because I know that uh, your your career is 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 uh, quite varied with with regards to you know being a neuropsychiatrist, uh, you know, uh, working in mathematics, having, having uh, several different hats working in, 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 in med school and, you know, putting together some pretty, pretty complex integrated treatment units. Um, so can you, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, who is John? Yeah, well, uh, I'm probably different now, but when I started out, I, um, I specialize in neuropsychiatry and I ended up creating a lot of programs for the elderly, for brain injured. Um, I created many brain injury programs and I pioneered in various fields, uh, including um, integrating medicine, neurology and psychiatry, which had always been kind of separate. And uh, I, I had fellowships to train people to think holistically with all three uh, medicine's very segmented and they miss a lot because of that. But so I ended up there. I worked in hospitals my whole career um, and I created many hospital programs and then a lot of brain injury programs. I still do a brain injury program and a little bit of hospital work. But about 10 years ago, I, uh, you know, I've dealt a lot with how illness affects the mind and how the mind affects illness because I see many diseases, I see brain diseases uh, of all kinds. So I began to uh, try to research what mind is. And, uh, and what I discovered early on is that we have no idea what mind is and that we don't know where it is and we don't know what consciousness is and we don't know what um, intelligence is, we don't know a lot. 
And there's no place in the brain, in the human brain, for subjective experience. For example, if a scientist want to deny that it even exists, and yet we all know we have subjective experience, um, and uh, it's not describable. So I started uh, the website searching for the mind, which where I was trying to figure out what it is and where it is in nature. And I wrote a lot about neuroplasticity, about the human brain. And I have about more than 200 articles on my website. And I developed you know, a blog that was popular, won some awards on neuroplasticity. But I became uh, convinced that it's a lot more than the human brain. And I started studying animal brains. And I had the honor of writing some articles, some of my, my blogs with... Uh, uh, Dr. Beckoff was a great animal expert. I was comparing bees, birds, and lizards. And um, it became apparent that even the tiniest animal brains are extremely intelligent. Bees have symbolic logic. They have a symbolic language. They can memorize five miles of uh, exact flowers and, how, and the value. Uh, and they can solve a mathematical problem of where to go to get the most value. And they uh, self-medicate their hive. Ants are a whole nother story. They, have, they learn 50 different ways that they can find directions. So individual termites, ants, and bees, I wrote about how intelligent they are. But then I became rather amazed at how intelligent cells are. And what my blog was is there are these uh, scientific journals that everyone knows, Science Magazine, Nature Magazine. And I would find the top articles, review articles, and basically translate them into English because no one can read them because they're filled with gobbledygook of, of, of genes and receptors and uh, all kinds of names. It's, it's incomprehensible. People would ask what languages I speak. And I'd say, well, I speak molecular genetics and uh, microbiology and uh, those are the languages. And I basically translated a subject, a review article into English each week for 10 years, and it became more and more apparent to me uh, how smart cells are and how everything is based upon cells. Everyone knows that neurons talk to each other. You know, neurons send signals. We're all taught that in school. There are neurotransmitters, et cetera. But no one really realizes that all cells talk as much as the neurons and that it's all happening uh, including microbes, including viruses, including uh, fungus, including plants and trees. And, and all the cells are talking to each other in the same language, which is why microbes can be so influential in our lives, because they speak our language and they can therefore uh, interfere or help or uh, interact in various ways. So I became um, more and more aware that everything is based on this uh, intelligent signaling between cells. You know, a cell could be a capillary cell in one part of the body, and it's, it, it knows to send a signal all the way to the bone marrow somewhere else, all the way to a white blood cell, all the way to the brain. And um, these signals back and forth between the brain and the immune system and the, and the gut cells and the skin cells and, uh, are really how everything works. And I became apparent to me that there's no book about this. So I endeavored to write a book where I eliminated all jargon. I, uh, I, the book uh, is for just anyone, really. And many people have said that, that they can understand it. And it's basically a visual tour of cells interacting everywhere, uh, both uh, you know, you have to break it down to start somewhere. So I, I did divide it into the first chapters about body cells. So there's the, the skin cell, the gut cell, the white blood cell, the T cell, cancer cells, then the brain cells, all the various brain cells that has chapters on pain. And then a fourth section is on microbes and how they talk, including viruses, a lot about viruses, about their lifestyle. And then the fourth uh, section is about how the compartments in the cells talk to, like mitochondria the nucleus talk to each other in the same way. So the communication is going way down deep into the cell. And I realized that this is how life works. This is basically, and I don't see that anywhere. And it basically, the conclusion is not popular in, in, in science because I'm basically showing that cells are very intelligent and that uh, that has to be taken into account 
when we define life, like what is life? They say life is a cell with reproduction, but it, it, it isn't. It's, it's a cell that can talk and that can communicate with other cells and somehow knows how to do that, which is uh, beyond belief, really. It's so amazingly complicated, but the book isn't complicated. It's detailed. There's a lot of detail, but it, it, it's basically a visualization so you can see for yourself how it works. I don't draw any conclusions in the book because on my website, if you've seen it, uh, I basically vowed not to speculate. So everyone speculates, but I don't speculate. I basically find I am now, now that I finished my book, I expect, you know, but I say I'm now I'm speculating. So I'll speculate for you. But the, 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 the thing is I, in my blog and I only speculated once in 200 articles and I stated clearly, I'm going to speculate um, in the book. It's all based on the top scientific articles from science and journals, nature, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there's nothing there that isn't proven fact. So I wanted to do that because I didn't want to be attacked for, um, you know, speculating, for making things up. Uh, so everything in the book is a fact and proven by the hard science. And I give those references at the end of each, you know, at the end of the book, if anyone, but no one can read those references, the problem, because they're in libraries tucked away with all these words that no one can figure out so uh, anyway that i don't know if that's a synopsis of the story no it's very it's very interesting because in 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 so many ways that's what true science should be doing being the observer not not being the judge and you know i think speculation can only come afterwards and that's from from having great experience and insight and even then you know, the speculator appreciates and understands how, how little they probably know because the complexities are just so, so great. And uh, maybe that, that, that's where your, your uh, uh, mathematical sort of brain also comes in, 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 into play and says, I've got to look at this in, a, in, in the most purest way. Um, so for, for me, it, it's very exciting because I, I, I like the uh, concept and the practice of, of um, being the observer because you know, the mind very quickly creates a narrative, I, I, you know, call it, you know, a story to, to, to fit whatever's, whatever it sees. And this is where we see, obviously, um, you know, biases, you know, confirmation bias is a classic one. Come about, you can tell any story that you like. Well, there's a lot of hype in science, a lot of hype. Um, there's a lot of hype in neuroscience, but in all science. In other words, certain groups are digging in. Uh, uh, they want everything to be random. But it's absurd. If you look, it's not random. You build a, a machine that has, you know, 10,000 parts intricately related that has channels for water and channels for electrons and channels for oxygen and channels for uh, ATP. And, uh, and, and this is a huge machine that spans across and interacts in a thousand ways. How can this be random? It doesn't make any sense that it's random. doesn't mean we know how this came about, but... The cell is not random. The cell is extremely complicated and uh, very. I mean, look at look at termites. So termites build this thing in the desert that's like ten feet high. That is basically an air conditioned skyscraper that changes the entire oasis. It, it creates an oasis for all the other animals. It becomes a focus. Of, and, it, and it's such an elaborate engineering feat that we can't do that. We, humans could not build what these termites build. And if you go and just break it, a guard comes out, says, get away. And then other builders come and rebuild it exactly. Um, so it, it's fantastically complicated. And cells are far more complicated than this. So to me, a cell is like an incredible brain. Um, that works not with neurons, but it works with what they call transcription factors. It works with proteins and RNAs and molecules that are interacting in cascades that have all the complexity of a brain. In other words, there's this circuit and this circuit and this circuit, and they're intersecting in various ways. Um, and this is how they respond to many, many things at the same time. Cells can respond and microbes, which are tiny, compared to our, our cells are thousands of times bigger and microbes 
have the same machinery. They have the same ATP, ATP machine. They, they have the photosynthesis machines that are unbelievable. We can't even figure out, we, we can't even get the structure, let alone how it was designed and let alone the, the code for the photosynthesis machines. They're so complicated and they're very, very advanced. You know, talk about mathematics, they're very advanced electron machines. They're photon and electron, they're, they're really quantum machines, you know, uh, anyway. And and t- can you talk a little bit about how how the uh, uh, you know w- within the human body how these conversations occur? Obviously, looking at the mental health uh, aspect is is my interest. How yeah. how do these two spaces work? I mean, we all know the, the the classic adage of you know stress is not good for you, and you know there's science that goes out and says well a level of stress is and. You know, but where is this sort of number and so on and so forth, and yeah. you know, how do we measure it? But uh, you know, we 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 see you know at least on um, on the outside quite quite complex presentations in in how human beings are. There, there, there's lots of you know if we talk about it from a biological perspective, variation. You know, which probably is helpful. You know, considering Darwin's Darwin's uh, work. Uh, but h- how do we? see these communications take place and, 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 and what's important in the mental health space? Yes, good. Well, there's a lot about this in the book. So everyone, as I said before, neurons talk to each other in circuits. We know that. But the truth of the matter is the circuits include immune cells, gut cells, etc. So let me just talk about one example, which is a, a key example, is how I call the brain, the the wired brain and the immune system, the wireless brain. So they're talking to each other. So if you consider uh, the brain, you really have to consider all the cells, but the most striking research has been with the immune system. So let me me talk about stress. I'll give you an example. So um, there's a center in the brain and by the way, I'll talk about the communication in both directions, from the neuron side to the immune system and from the immune system to the neuron side, um, back and forth. And equally important, um, the, uh, they're, they're, when the fetus is developing, it, it builds um, a trillion neurons and then gets rid of most of them and ends up with about 86 billion um, neurons. And it gets rid of those others, by the way, in a very neat way that doesn't make any inflammation. It, they, they sort of cut it up and process it. And it, it, it's not like it uh, creates debris or, or any problem. And what happens is that as, so once the baby is born, as we get older, we don't make a lot of neurons. We make a very tiny amount. So in an adult brain, we're making about a thousand neurons every day. And um, most of them, Almost all of them are in the memory center, the hippocampus, and in the nose. Um, And uh, the way memory works, the way remembering works, is that when you're an adult, one of these neurons that's minted, and then it travels and it goes to the memory center, and there it starts uh, connecting, uh, it starts its life connecting, it basically becomes the center for a, a, a new memory. And the memory can be a reworking of the old memory, which can have uh, cells there that it gradually replaces. So this new uh, brain cell, called they call it neurogenesis, genesis being creation. And we all know now that memory is key in this neurogenesis, as well as neuroplasticity is the changing of uh, existing circuits, but also making these new cells and incorporating them into it. So when there is an infection, so no one knew that there were any immune cells in the brain. And then they discovered the microglia, which is basically in the ninth day of the fetus, it's a macrophage. It's actually a, a, a white blood cell that goes to the the brain area, and then it lives its life there and it makes children and it lives in one little territory. And until we discovered that, we didn't think there were any immune cells in the brain and it's very walled off. But what we didn't know until recently is that in the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the brain and these ventricles, there are uh, at least half a million T cells. 
And T cells are the most intelligent. They're the master immune cells. They direct everything. So the T cells are in constant communication with the neuron. So when we get sick, we have a, a, an infection, the neuron, uh, the, the T cell tells the neuron uh, we're sick and you have to take care of yourself. So that it says, create the sick feeling. So the T, the T cell sends this signal. Well, normally it sends a pulse of keeping normal cognition. When they're sick, it changes the pulse to say, now you're sick, you get this brain fog, lie down, you have to take care of yourself. And that's the sick feeling, okay? When we are healthy again, only the T cell can tell the neuron to stop the sick feeling and move on and come back to normal cognition. That's one thing it does. There, you know, I'm picking uh, related to your question about stress. Now, in acute stress, um, actually memories improved, and uh, acute stress can be productive and positive. It's when stress goes on a little bit longer, it becomes negative. And so, chronic stress. Uh, so, what happens is the T cell has the ability to tell the neuron. Um, to make less of these uh, brain cells. So it tells the stem cells. So in the brain, they're making less of these new neurons. And that's the brain fog you get with chronic stress and with depression. Depression, the same thing happens. And whenever you treat depression for whatever means, you know, either psychotherapy or medications, or you could just get better, or you go to the woods, um, the uh, when you're depressed, there's less of these uh, new memory brain cells. And uh, when um, you're uh, better, uh, it goes back to normal. Uh, let me just throw in something as an aside. I want to come back to this. Uh, these are called neuroimmune conversations or neuroimmune uh, reflexes. They're called neuroimmune circuits, various things where the neurons telling the T cell and the T cells telling the neuron. But one of the things that we have are bad memories. And the brain has what's called reconsolidation of memory, where the, the brain, um, when we sleep or nap, the brain uh, changes, it loosens um, all the synapses and it picks uh, the ones it, want, the, it wants to emphasize and it gets rid of some of the others. And so there's a chance to change memory in this reconsolidation process. So what you can do is remember the traumatic event and re-remember it. And by re-remembering it, you add a current situation to the old memory. So, uh, you know, it, it could be you, you remember it's a Cadillac rather than just it's a car, you know, you're a Chevy rather than a car. Um, but what you can do directly is for yourself is re-remember it and add a feeling of love of self-worth or something good that's happened with people uh, recently uh, and re-remember the trauma with this little addition to it and what will happen is what's happening in the brain is that the new brain cell is minted and it starts taking on uh, the new memory, the new reconsolidation of memory, and it starts creating uh, uh, connections and starts signaling. And eventually this younger uh, neuron is stronger and eventually will gradually uh, replace or at least be more dominant than the old memory. And you can keep doing this. So, so, so that's, uh, that's in the direction. Now, neurons, we, we never knew that neurons I mean, we never knew that T cells can tell neurons what to do, but we also never knew that neurons can tell the entire immune system what to do and can create inflammation and can uh, create um, various situations, various blood cells. So this starts to explain two things that are interesting, and it's in the book. Uh, one is meditation effect on immunity, and the other is acupuncture. So um, we we've known for many years that meditation um, has many positive health effects. It clearly has good mental effects. In other words, uh, the mind basically concentrates and then free associates. And in milliseconds, it's going back and forth between concentrating and free associating. And uh, meditation really uh, does 
strengthens both. So you end up with more free association. That's where the creativity comes in and more focused concentration when you're, uh, when we're concentrating, but, and it, it clearly affects the vagus nerve. So we know that the vagus nerve affects the heart and the gut, you get a calming gut, you get a calming heart, you get breathing that's relaxing. So this is kind of clear, but no one figured out how can it affect T cells and how can it affect viruses um, until these neuroimmune circuits were found where we realized that the neuro, the neuron can change the immunity. It can make better immune cells. It can create a situation where we fight with viruses. So again, through the vagus nerve, uh, this can uh, this can happen now. Acupuncture has been known to work, but no one has any idea how it works because the, logically, from the Western mind, acupuncture would work based based on energy flow. So, what's energy flow? Well, it's blood vessels and nerves are what you think of, but acupuncture is not related to either one of them. So, uh, studies recently have shown it's only recently that you can observe these communications. You know, observing a little molecule in the middle of a cell or in the blood is, is fantastically complicated. So, this research is very advanced and it's just happening now as we're speaking, which is what I say on my website, all the best science is all been discovered in the last year. But the problem is keeping up with it and figure out what it means and, and it translating into English is, is a big problem. But um, so what happens is you, you have an acupuncture board and they've done this research where you stimulate it with even electricity. Sometimes they do that or with other things. And what happens is they notice that in the wrist, they're doing this acupuncture point, but they're stimulating a T cell that happens to be sitting there in the tissue. And the T cell then travels a little bit and communicates and sends signals to the neuron. And again, this is a circuit that includes neuron. And then the neuron sends it through the brain and affects the kidney on the other side of the body. Um, no one had any idea how this could happen, but this is one way that it can happen is through these new um, complex circuits that include not just neurons, but include astrocytes and microglia and skin cells and T cells. And, and, and what we're finding out about pain, that this is a lot of this is in the chapter called pain and inflammation in the brain section. It's a small chap. All the chapters are small and again, easy to read um, for anyone, but what happens, what we're learning about chronic pain is that the circuits are fantastically complicated and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of it. So there are circuits that involve five neurons, four T cells, another immune cell, a microglia, maybe a microbe, a gut cell, and they're all communicating with all kinds of signals. I, I give an example in the, in the book where there's like a hundred signals going on in one little, one synapse, a pain synapse. And so pain is going to be a hard one to figure out because it also involves um, the entire higher part of the brain. All the different centers get in the act and start sending signals downward. As the signal comes up, there's all kinds of signals down and that modulates it anyway. But the point is these neuroimmune circuits are going to help a lot in, the, uh, in, in figuring out pain. John, can you talk a little bit about for the lay person and myself, uh, how do we know what, what are the experiments that have looked at how the cell communicates? You know, are we looking at an electrical impulse? Are we looking at that these, the, the, these two organisms, you know, when you stimulate one, you know, we can't see a pulse, but the other one is stimulated that it somehow transfers information or what, what, what's the sort of uh, the research behind that or the, or, or the studies right. that well, allow us to know. It's not simple. It's really complicated, but I can describe it very simply. Uh, basically the cells communicate. I mean, there are probably more ways like they probably communicate through photons and light, but we, we haven't figured that out much yet. We, we know that light is part of it because photons affect electrons, which affect energy and cells and they affect uh, photosynthesis and all that. So, and they affect the eyes that that's just hitting a cell and changing uh, a chemical. The light is changing a chemical. And, and a matter of fact, with, with dim light, uh, the rods, you can just have five photons. We are, 
aware of five photons that hit the rods at night in the dark. And we're aware something's happening because it's amplified through these circuits. There are circuits inside the cell. So one molecule is sitting, there's the membrane and it's sitting on the top and it goes through the membrane to the bottom. And in there, it has all kinds of uh, interactions with other molecules. And they're, you know, this one does this one, and they, they hit this one, and they cause phosphorylation. They cause various chemical interactions all the way down to the nucleus, where again, you create, uh, uh, there's a language of, of factors that tell the nucleus what proteins to make. And one little signal can make like 50 proteins because it's amplified and it's through these circuits. But what's happening is, so the cells, a lot of it is through chemicals. So these are little chemicals that float between the cells like a neurotransmitter, but neurotransmitters we recall are in sacs. So they use sacs also all over the place. Like cancers love to send information in sacs. They fill them with uh, genes, even DNA and other, even a, even a, a mitochondria that they've changed to become a friend as opposed to, to help the cancer. So uh, little sacs filled with information molecules are one way, just secreting molecules. Now, when a cell secretes a molecule and sends it in the blood all the way around the body, the cell that picks it up, has to have built a receptor. So it has to know the game. So the cells somehow know how to build thousands and thousands of receptors and send thousands of signals. And so th that's why I mean they're intelligent because cells and different cells make different receptors and different signals. Like the kidney cells are limited to making certain ones, but they all make some that communicate about inflammation and infection. Um, so that's one, one of the main things. But then there's electricity. Uh, and electricity, we know about the axon. People know electricity goes down the axon. And this is based upon channels in the membrane that um, uh, you have ions. You have a positive sodium, a positive potassium, and you have a negative chloride, et cetera. Anyway, by in, by in and out, by control of in and out of these channels, a electrical wave is propagated down the axon until the end where it suddenly triggers calcium to come out of some place. And then that's a chemical signal or a gradient. In other words, just the amount is there. Um, probably the electricity around the cell is part of it, but that's new. Now we do know about nanotubes. That's the, one of the latest things. So nanotubes are tiny little protein tubes that microbes use for inches. They can go all the way down into the soil and the microbes in the bottom can be eating, living off minerals and send electrons and the microns inches away could be feeding on, on, on that. But in the human cell, these nanotubes are really everywhere, but we, the neurons have them, but we really don't understand yet. It's so, they're so tiny, but cancer cells we know love nanotubes and they build these nanotubes and they send a cancer cell is like a super intelligent microbe. In other words, microbes we know are smart and have villages and build biofilms and, and communicate through signals. Uh, cancers are like that. They're individuals that form groups, work together. We all know that microbes can send um, uh, resistance genes, you know, you, you get a, a resistant antibiotic, you give an antibiotic and the microbe learns how to eject that antibiotic through a, actually it's a fancy machine that shoots it out. It's like a rocket ship. It's amazing. It's called the secretion syndrome. Anyway, they make, and viruses transfer these genes around. So in the microbes can send the genes. So vacanters do the same thing. They do them through these nanotubes and through little sacs. They send genes around that will work against the medications we're giving. So we give a medication and the cancer cell figures out how to fight it. And it takes that gene and it sends it to all their buddies and they work as a group. Um, so nanotubes, sacs, chemicals, electricity are what we, have, we know a lot about. We know the most about chemicals uh, because we can see those more easily and trace where they go and what the responses are. And we know a lot about when that chemical hits the receptor, what happens, and uh, we don't know how that cell knows to have that receptor. I mean, that's, that's what's fantastic. How does a cell know 
that it needs to know this, uh, you know, and prepare before the events. That's what's fantastic. Uh, one of the things that's fantastic about this. Um, so again, photons are future. We know that everything's based on electrons. I mean, electron is what powers everything. Um, like our gadgets. I mean, our, our life is powered by electricity. Uh, everything, every machine we have is powered by electricity. These are moving electrons. The same is true in the body. The electrons start from a photon. Light hits mm -hmm. a molecule, shoots off an electron. The electron it's, travels. It's, and then, uh, what's that? It's really interesting because in, in so many ways, this is how psychology is, is trying to target those two areas. One is, uh, you know, Psychiatry will offer chemical, um, uh, 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 I suppose, um, attempts to go out and, and, and change, you know, states and, and, and psyche and the like. And psychology is uh, doing it through, you know, maybe light impulses or information, you know, things that we hear and we interpret, perspective uh, changes that that we, we, we hope maybe start that domino effect of, of observing the world in a less threatening way, for example. Um, but in, in so many ways, I'm just hearing the, 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 the those two things. Well, what's interesting um, is system. that for a while, when the, the biology came up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it sort of wiped out uh, mind and wiped out psych psychotherapy until the now the latest science is showing that psychotherapy does the same thing. It works through these, uh, this communication creates these chemical changes. It's just vastly, vastly more complicated than the psychiatrists thought with their dopamine and serotonin, which, which is like a trivial dressing on the top of, of, a, of a, you know, when I used to lecture about the brain, I would tell people, I do my brain lectures, I say, well, 90% of the brain is glutamate and GABA, which we know nothing about. And we have like 10 drugs totally in medicine. And then sprinkled on top, 2%, is epinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, histamine, acetylcholine, all that. That's, those are little modulators of the machinery of which we know nothing about. We, the glutamate is vastly, vastly more complex. We don't know anything. And we have hundreds of drugs for these modulators. And we have, um, you know, a handful of drugs for the 90% for the, the guts of how the brain is operating, which we don't have a clue about. But the point I'm making is that the latest neuroscience, the latest molecular biology, I should say, not the neuroscience, is because the neuroscientists still want to believe that their MRIs are showing mind things. Uh, but the molecular biologists can see that psychotherapy is doing the same things that uh, they try to do with these drugs. And sometimes do. I mean, drugs, medications. I was a you know expert in medications for many years. I lectured on it. Uh, I'm not against medications, but they're, you know, they're a cannon rather than a, uh, you know, you're you're shooting a big thing as for a tiny, uh, where it there there's no subtlety in them, it's, and the subtlety is in this molecular biology stuff I'm talking about. It's it's interesting because the the common person still quotes that same old um, you know marketing piece of of you know there's a chemical imbalance and and and, and still there's a lot of medical medical um, professionals that 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 you know spit out the exact same thing. And my understanding is that there's no such no, thing as a theoretical idea. It's never actually been been demonstrated, and hence why we don't go out and and actually do tests before we give these, they, they, these uh, drugs. Well, we don't we, have we any just tests. Say, oh, he's roughly X amount of milligrams, and we don't really know why we're doing that, and hence great variation. There are no in, tests. There are yeah. no tests. Everything is a chemical imbalance. Life is a chemical imbalance. <laughs> uh, so, uh, cells are off equilibrium. You know, that's the definition of a cell. It's, it's not in equilibrium, not in chemical equilibrium. We have no idea how psychiatry works. It's so much more complicated. As a matter of fact, about 10 years ago, maybe six years ago, Incel, who was the head of National Institute of Health in the United States, he said, uh, I'm only going to research, give money for proven theories. Everything stopped. There was no more research, no more drugs. <laughs> There's nothing because we don't have any idea how these things work. I'll give you a, a small example. So, Migraines are a big deal. And 
everyone were treating them with triptans, which are basically a serotonin drug. And they found that antidepressants, tricyclics mainly, that have both norepinephrine and serotonin could help migraines somewhat just by experience. And they found that Elevil was the best. Um, and everyone thought that's from serotonin. But with the new science, a totally new neurotransmitter was found. I won't even give you the name. It's a gobbledygook name. No one can remember it. And basically it comes from the facial nerve. There's, instead of a seizure, a seizure is like a, a amplification of electricity. A migraine is the opposite. It's a depression. It's a spreading depression. It hits the trigeminal nerve and then it secretes a particular neurotransmitter um, that we knew nothing about. We just found it about through doing this kind of signaling, finding a new signal. And they found that Elevil by chance happened to hit this, uh, of all the antidepressants, Elevil is the one that happened to hit this one thing through some chemical thing we don't understand. So what happened is they went back to the drawing board and have created a whole new class of drugs based upon this new neurotransmitter. And those are coming out now. Uh, so that's just one trivial example it's not trivial to migraine people, but it, I mean, it, it, this is happening all over the brain. We just don't know enough to talk about psychiatry. We do know enough to talk about what I'm talking about is, the, is that everything's based upon cells, intelligent cells. I think that it, I make a very clear argument. Um, and, you know, Ray Kurzweil reviewed my book and he wrote that he thinks that looking at this, it makes you wonder if... Um, uh, if intelligence in nature is based upon building blocks of these uh, intelligent cells. Now, I say wonder, so clearly that's a speculation. I should warn you that that's a, a speculation. It's, it's fascinating. I'm reading a book at the moment, uh, almost titled the same as yours. It's called, uh, uh, the, the, not, not the secret, but, but the, hidden, um, the Hidden Life of Trees. Oh, yeah, um, I know the book well. And uh, yeah, the, 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 there's so much obviously um, you know, microbiology that's going on in these forests and trees and, and, and how the fungi um, go out and play this you know, incredible, incredibly important role. But for, you know, every single cell of, of, of the tree is communicating. You know, so when, when the moment there's a, a bite you know, of an insect on, on a leaf, it, you know, the, the, that, those, those cells tell you know, some part of the other, some part of the tree to release particular chemicals to make the, the, the um, leaf actually taste awful, but also to attract insects that like to eat those, that, that, those uh, predators that are eating it, um, which also then communicates to the trees next to it. Um, yeah, certainly those that are downstream because, um, well, uh, downwind, my apologies, because it comes out as a pheromone or something. It's really, really fascinating. It just blowing my every, mind because but it's it's more than trees. Every plant in the forest is connected by the fungal wires, and the fungal wires are sending not just nutrients but information, like you're talking about. They 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 share information in defense. Um, by the way, the woman who discovered this just wrote a book after many years called "The Search for the Mother Tree." She's the actual scientist that 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 found this out. Um, and uh, she, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, she's the, the, the mother of this field. Um, so I have a chapter in there, one little example. It's funny, the editor wanted to take it out because it's not directly related to everything else. But I said, no, you must put this in. And what this chapter is about is the communication between bacteria and fungus and uh, plants for uh, nitrogen fixation. So what happens is plants can't fix nitrogen. They need nitrogen to live on and they can only get it if it happens to be in the soil, if it happens through lightning or various ways. So what they do is they make a deal with a microbe or a fungus. And what they do is they, you know, there's all kinds of negative bacteria at the root system and the root is then um, sends out signals and a friendly microbe sends signals, I'm here, I'm your friend. And they send about 100 signals, checkpoints back and forth to say, are you really a friend or are you a pathogen? Are you going to start a disease if I let you in? And eventually they create a bond through a lot of communication. And the plant cell says, yes, come in. And it then creates a pathway. It's, uh, I call it the yellow brick road in my book. It's basically oscillations of calcium. They create a path into the plant 
and say, come here, and the, and the microbes come in and build the colony, and the plant then builds a factory around them where they're protected and they live happily ever after, and the, and the plant gives them goodies like sugar and all kinds of good stuff, and the plant and the microbes fix nitrogen for them, and they live off the nitrogen. Uh, these are called uh, uh, nodules. They're uh, uh, all, almost all uh, the plants we eat, uh, the grains have these nodules. Now in the fungus, they're much smaller, they're cellular. The, the bacterial nodules are large, you can see them uh, visually. So again, this is a communication that could be blocked at any point because it involves a lot of back and forth checking for that. Um, but the fungus story, you know, plants could not come onto land from the uh, in evolution without fungus. I mean, they were there from the beginning. It's not like they're separate. So there's no, it was not an add-on. In other words, the fungus helped the plants, allowed them to come out of the sea onto land. And the fungus is intimately related. I, I have a, a, an article on my website, Are Fungus the Dominant Life Form on Earth? You could also say that phage viruses are the dominant life form or ants, but the fungus is one of the, uh, that we don't study enough. We don't really um, realize how significant funguses are with this uh, amazing communication that includes uh, the entire forest. I mean, really, literally every plant. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit here. And, and I, I suppose that this all poses a, a question where it's, it, 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 it's us whether the tree is, is independent or individual to, to the forest and, and, I think most of us can kind of appreciate that in many ways um, they, they, they are one and the same thing. They have to be in, in, in a relationship. They are, you know, um, uh, the, the, the forest is a unit, but it's a unit of many, many things. It's kind of like a human being, you know, that, that what you're describing is um, there are many parts uh, to, to us. The question I ask is, uh, with an understanding of, of cells um, communicating with one another, does that branch over across to uh, our environment and that our environment in, in, in so many ways is, is, is us, you know, cause I, you know, when I think about trauma in, in, in my therapeutic work, uh, the, the, the trauma has actually come from, one's you know uh, environment particularly in growing up you know when, when I look at stress you know the, the context that someone tells me about their life story you know is always easy to validate my clients because it's like after I've heard your story how else should you be feeling um, they're, 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 there's nothing strange or odd about feeling depressed or anxious or whatever it might be from what you've just told me if I was in those contexts yeah I would feel exactly the same if I was observing the world or noticing the world or I had that level of threat. So are these cells, you know, not really uh, just about how they communicate inside us, but rather that we're part of this, this, this bigger, bigger thing. And I don't know whether we call it uh, life, whether we call it uh, everything, whether we call it uh, earth, um, maybe even beyond that, because there's the, obviously there's photons that are hitting our eyeballs from the sun and, um, that that expand further than that. How 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 well, uh, how far am I stretching the bow? Well, with my prejudice to stick with pure science, which greatly limits what I can do. Although I'm going to speculate in my next book, but basically I'm looking at all the levels of brains. So we have our brains interrelating with other beings. We have the internet now, which is a super brain. We have um, our organs talking among themselves and in the organs. We have this cellular level of cells talking to each other inside the cell. We have the same complex intelligent communication between the molecules. So the molecules are intelligent. The last chapter of my book is, I sort of threw it in as a tease because it's a molecule that communicates. So the implication is that this intelligence goes deeper than just cells, that it's in matter, which is my prejudice, um, is that mind and intelligence is, is an aspect of nature 
as part of physics, in other words, basically inherently. And so you have all the way up. So, and then you start with the photons and the electrons uh, that are communicating and they're, and then the cells are communicating and the organs are communicating and the people are communicating and the, the mental uh, structures are built up. I have a speculation about that, but uh, uh, so I'm just going to try to describe all these levels, but are we all integrated? Yes. I mean, uh, there, there was the Gaia theory of earth. Uh, it was vague, but now it's getting more specific. In other words, now we're seeing uh, the, the details of how this interrelationship, I mean, we all know people are interrelated. You can't exist uh, or you can make believe it, but even your mind, you're going to be relating, you know, whether you think you're, whether you think you are or not, you're going to be relating. Uh, we were born relating where uh, we die relating, uh, but the same is true of our cells and the same is true of our molecules. So, um, Yes, I think it's one huge interweaving uh, uh, network uh, that is life and intelligence or whatever you want to call it. But we, we don't know how to define any of this. Mm. Uh, so we end up uh, with theories or with beliefs, you know, the religions go into it, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, this is where our narratives can very easily be formed. You know, we, we, we do very quick pattern recognition and make up a, a uh, uh, an idea to follow that. And, and you know, it, it can sound very credible very easily without, without having to prove anything. Yeah, it's, I mean, I see the only way I can approach it other than my own meditative experience of actually experiencing the unity, I mean, that's the purpose of these religious versions of meditating, is to um, show with the best current science the interrelationship, and it's fantastic how complicated it is. I mean, you look at ATP, which is the energy molecule, it comes from the electricity and the photon, and that ATP is the letter in DNA, which is very strange to me, that the energy particle and the information particle are the same. Um, they're the same molecule, which is, I find interesting because we have no idea how this information could be laid down to create the, I mean, to call it complex is, is to trivialize it. I mean, to, to, <laughs> to call these massive, multiple complex, you know, you're talking about 30 or 40 proteins, each with thousands of parts, all calling each other, interrelating in order to accomplish something that involves sending information to, to a totally different cell halfway around the body. Um, how does that happen? Uh, we, we don't have any, any idea. But I do want to show that modern science is showing the intelligence. I mean, it, it, it's showing uh, the non-randomness, the, uh, the, the purposeful uh, existence of molecules, not the random existence of molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, In some sense, this is why... Uh, previous medicine when we look back at it and and likewise you know in, in many ways maybe psychology too uh, is laughable um in in some aspects because the the, the theories and ideas were, were, were based on the current you know science that we had at the at the time but uh, as you say the only way to keep up is to, to look at the last 12 months that that uh understanding it is getting better and better but also acknowledging the tools that are better. We're able to observe yeah, a molecule, yeah. the structure of this incredibly complicated molecule. Uh, so when you read these biochemistry books today, they're, they're, they're unbelievable how the, this massive, massive molecule, and you have one little section where this amino acid flips a little bit when the photon hits it, when the light hits it, uh, and then it changes, and then it, this happens, and that happens, and this happens, and that happens, and 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 that is part of the signaling. Um, and this is psychology. It's psychiatry. It's neurology. It's it's the way it works. It's the way our 
brain works. It's the way our immune works. Um, so uh, now I'm not, a, as I say, I was a psychopharm expert. I, I treated thousands of patients over 40 years and I think I helped a lot of people, but do I think I know why they worked or where they came from or um, they were accidents, basically. Psychiatry is, is, is a series of, I used to lecture about this. Psychiatry is a series of accidents. So in the 1950s, I used to say, in my psychopharm lectures, I'd say from 1954 to 1956, God said, let there be psychopharmacology. And what happened in the next two years, we discovered the four classes of medicine that are to this day, the same classes. We discovered lithium. We discovered uh, antipsychotic, Thorazine. We discovered antidepressant, naphrenol. And we discovered, uh, uh, you know, a Valium. So, or, you know, type, these are type drugs, these four types of drugs. And to this day, we don't have any new classes. Of, well, maybe, maybe a couple on the edges. But basically, psychiatry has been refining these particular medications that were accidents. The next big accident was in the 80s with Clozeril. Okay, so Clozeril is by far the best antipsychotic in terms of treating schizophrenia and, and psychosis. It's a very, very good drug. I've written papers on it and I introduced it to many patients. It's a problematic drug. It has a lot of side effects, but when you are tortured by schizophrenia and you can be, your mind can be clear it's worth the risk. And I saw many, many people who were helped by Clozeril. But, and then the newer antipsychotics came trying to be like Clozeril, to be like Mike, you know, you try to be like Clozeril. So Olanzapine and Risperidol, all those came later. Um, but it all was based upon the accident. The theory used to be in the 60s, uh, you give one drug and you pure, you, you give the pure drug and uh, you don't mix drugs and all that. And then it was discovered that Clozeril was the best drug and it was incredibly complicated. It had 50 different things happening. So they began to mix and match and say this drug and this drug, the combinations occurred and combinations were better. Uh, I've helped some people with incredibly, almost crazy combinations by just trying over years, try this, try this, try this. I had a woman I, in my brain injury program who had tried to kill herself. She was a model, she was very beautiful. And uh, she was disfigured by drinking lye and became extremely, uh, uh, you know, damaged herself very, very badly. And she was constantly suicidal. And her family were tortured. She was in one of my residential programs where she was watched all the time. She had no freedom. And I worked with her for 10 years, trying everything I could think of. And finally, I had five different drugs. And the suicidality went away. Just bing, boom. I had no idea why. Uh, she had no idea why. She was very grateful. And I keep it on my mantelpiece, a letter she sent me years later, which was, uh, you know, thank God you kept trying. You know, if you didn't, I'd be dead, you know, today. Mm -hmm. And I said, whatever you do, your family, don't change it. <laughs> and any psychiatrist who saw this combination was going to change it because it didn't make any sense. And it was wacko. And it, I have no idea why it worked. It was five different drugs. And it worked. Hmm. Her chem, the, the, the chemical imbalance. We accidentally came upon the chemical imbalance. It's, it's, it's so refreshing to hear uh, the way that you talk about this in, you know, what, what might be perceived by, by others as, as, as uh, uh, making yourself vulnerable or, or even quite, threatening to to a you know, uh, an industry or, or a practice when you know in fact it it, it just sounds so uh, reasonable and rational and in psychology in, in so many ways we have theories we have ideas and we certainly have you know best practice uh, you know science driven uh, protocols to look at but at the same time we're just looking at an immense amount of variability it's, it's how well can you have 
how well can you develop therapeutic relationship, that rapport with a client that's going to create trust, uh, and then lots and lots of variability of information, which is pers- perspective taking, and based on that, maybe some behavior change because there's that trust, and we'll try this, we'll try this, we'll try this, we'll try this. So I have a I have a real strong bias towards long term. Um, I don't know if I'd use the word therapy, uh, maybe long term um, commitment to. Uh, insightful conversation about how one lives their life uh, uh, rather than it being therapeutic because it, it we can do this by ourselves. We can do this with colleagues, with friends, with family members. Um, obviously it's useful to have someone who's maybe trained uh, in, in and has a relationship that is going to be non-judgmental uh, because they're outside of your, 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 your immediate circle. There's obviously great, great benefits, but it, that it, there is a refreshing nature of saying, we kind of don't know what we're doing and we kind of well, do. There, there, there is some um, validity it, to cognitive. Yeah, there, there, there's, there's some validity to both, cognitive. Both therapy. aspects happening. Sorry. Oh, there is some validity to cognitive type therapy. Absolutely, yeah. Learn different patterns and all that. But I used to talk about psychotherapy. I would say you, you sit there for, you know, I, I would say if you tell anyone you're doing this, anyone, they will say, no, I'm not, you're doing that. And that's human nature, not to look at what you're doing. So no one can see what their behavior is. They have no idea what their behavior is. And they don't look at the patterns. And psychotherapy to me was you sit there long enough. And then three years, three years later, one day, they say, they suddenly stop and they say, what do you think? And you say, do you really want to know? Do you want to know what I think? Are you sure? You want to listen to what I think? And they say, yeah, yeah. Tell me what you think. And that day you say, well, you know, you do this A, B, C, and D, and it causes EFG. And, and that's the only day they could listen to that because they, they were not in the frame of mind. And, and it's not human nature to listen to descriptions of your behavior. So, so anyway, it's, it's a little bit like what you're saying. I mean, it's a combination of trust, of love, of uh, mm-hmm. knowledge yes. about circumstances, helping people with the details of life, with cognitive approaches to things. But what's fascinating to me is that neuroscience is now proving the biological proof of psychotherapy. That's what's interesting to me because the biological people and insurance companies try to wipe it out by saying it's not biological. It's not Thorazine. It's not a drug. So it's not real. And now with the advanced science, we can see that it does change the brain. It changes the brain just like any kind of chemical change. When you have a relationship, when you uh, do psychotherapy, you're changing the chemistry of the brain. And that is known now. And I think that has amplified the value of psychotherapy. And we're going to go back. Like they don't do psychotherapy with schizophrenics anymore because they were institutionalized. It's biological. Forget about it. There's massive proof that psychotherapy helps schizophrenics. It helps the most devastated patients. I only worked in my programs with devastated, complicated patients. All my patients were hopeless. And I liked that because no one told me what to do. And I then could try whatever. And we had many, many successes. You know, I I like to work with the cases that supposedly nothing works with. So, John, what's your uh, next book going to be about? You said you're going to speculate a little bit more and, 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 you know, move away from from the science. And I suppose sounds to me like you know start consolidating the patterns that you've observed that 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 what what you've kind of recognized through through all of your studies well there's two parts one would be like this interview where we talk about uh, the conclusions in life the other is a um, another detailed science book but about these levels of brains at every level all the way up and all the way down how the intelligence goes deep uh, into the fabric of uh, physics and science, uh, from cells to molecules to photons, electrons, uh, and going up to organs, to 
humans, to societies, to uh, the world, to our relationship with trees, um, all of it is related. Um, so I'm going to try to, uh, I'm reading widely in the details of science and taking a lot of notes and um, thinking about, those are two different books. I think one where we're talking about the kinds of things you and I are talking about, and one where I go again into the the, the, the detailed science and try to simplify and make it clear how these massive machines and energy and DNA, how this is all working. Uh, so that's what I'm working on. Nothing. Yeah, it's, it sounds very fascinating because psychology is that. We have an evidence base. The research has demonstrated. We know that there is better and worse outcomes so we use what what we know is best but we still don't know why you know and and that that elusive why uh is is, is and, what's and so we're including more mindful we're not mindfulness meditation we're including yeah, more it's understanding it's of how meditation uh, works uh daydreaming works how sleep works you know all of this is going to help the psychotherapy I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to, to to your next book. Is that is that a year away? Is that a couple of years away? Is that a consulting? Not quite sure. I'm semi-retired now. I the COVID made me go telemedicine, which I did for the whole year. I did it ran inpatient programs by telemedicine. Now I'm doing very little, uh, a little bit. So now I'm working full time on uh, research for the book, and I'm in the woods in Martha's Vineyard. I'm in a beautiful spot. Um, so I see nature all the time and, uh, that's helpful. So I'm hoping I, I, I can't say when I have no idea. Can you talk a little bit about just before I let you go? Cause I know we're coming to it towards the end. Can you tell me a little bit about the nature side? Because you did mention a little bit earlier when you said, you know, going, you know, for a walk in the woods, I think you said, um, uh, I, I, is, is there something about nature that, that, that yeah, there uh, is. is therapeutic that obviously has an evidence base. Well, there's two things I should mention. One is uh, I, I write an article on my website called The Five Secrets of Brain Health. And one of them is meaningful activity where you have brain-wide neuroplasticity, where you have the changes that occur with neuroplasticity, but brain-wide. But then the, the, the last one is nature. It, it's been shown that if you just walk in the woods, your brain is meditating. You immediately go into a meditative state. Um, and if you plant, if you take a plant and put it in a hospital uh, room, it has a positive effect on that patient. If, if from your apartment, you can just see a park in a tree that has a positive effect. Um, so, and being immersed in nature. Now, I don't know, I mean, on a fundamental level, we are uh, complementary with plants. I mean, we and plants are uh, absolutely entwined like the, like the fungus and the tree. We need each other. One makes oxygen, one makes CO2. Without the other, neither would exist at all. And so we're intimately related uh, and uh, somewhat complementary. And uh, I don't know if that you know, that's pure speculation uh, and a little crazy, probably. But uh, the but there's no doubt of the finding. So from the science point of view, there's no doubt that nature does this. Uh, why, again, we're back to why, um, why it happens, I can't tell you, but there's no question that it does. So the, the more someone could be in nature, uh, the better. It, it, it's a form of meditation. I mean, um, just being in nature, just sitting in nature is meditation. Mm. it's really interesting because so often when when you talk in those sort of areas it almost feels like it it, it it starts to wander off into the world of crazy but the science does tell us that there is value or there's there, there's good therapeutic outcomes or the stress levels go down we we can observe benefits but to prescribe go for a walk in a forest kind of sounds crazy it's kind of like you know, who's this doctor that I came in for, for medication, for, for chemicals, for pills. Yeah. I didn't come in for a walk. You know, I, I can read that on the internet. What's he talking about? <laughs> well, many years ago, just meditating was considered crazy. Yeah. And many years ago, <laughs> I've been a vegetarian for 40 years. That was considered crazy. So I guess I've been crazy for a long time. 
Um, maybe, maybe that's I'm, com- I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with it. So. Maybe, maybe that's not a bad way to live. Live crazy. <laughs> I, I think it's the only way to live. Really, yeah. you have to be a little crazy to enjoy sure, life right. because life is so stressful and it, it doesn't make any sense. And our modern world doesn't make any sense. And we're destroying the planet. And you know, there's so many terrible things that you have to be a little crazy to get beyond it i think mm. it's uh it's uh your your description of all the communication you know to to call it complex is, is clearly an understatement and, and and maybe to kind of say we have a rational understanding of life is 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 crazy in itself to say that so it's yeah, a really know. nice nice uh, segue to, to to finish up before we do, how can people get in touch? How can uh, people find out more about your work? Okay, well, I'm very active on Twitter, by the way. So Twitter, every day I put out two of art, my articles and I put out science uh, current articles of this week. And there's a lot of conversation of people. So uh, Twitter is a good way. Uh, it's it's uh, You can follow me and I'll follow you and send stuff back. So it's, it's at... John Leaf, MD. So it's J O N. Again, no one knows that. No one knew that until um, the Daily Show, until John Stewart. Uh, then they heard John for the first time with no H. So it's J O N L I E F F. Strange M D. At or you could just Google. Probably come up anyway. And um, Facebook is searching for the mind. I'm not as active on Facebook. I do the same. I put out stuff on Facebook, but there's not as much interaction. And my website is searching for the mind or John Leaf MD. And uh, there's a contact email on the website. Uh, people can email or they can Twitter, you know, send messages, send information by Twitter. So, uh, no, I look forward to And so it's an active, ongoing uh, search, you know, so... John, I really do appreciate your time, your expertise, and 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 your contributions as as well. I think we need more more people like yourself. You know, if I can if I can call you a purist, um, in 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 many ways, a real scientist, and 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 that to me is extremely refreshing because I think that's what makes our world uh, more well informed, um, and 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 allows us to to at least then speculate about how to live a better life, um, even if that means, you know, being a bit crazy. Uh, thanks very much, John. Appreciate Thank your time you. and uh, yeah, look forward to your, your next book. It's great talking with you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you